Alrighty, welcome to another episode of Tyler's Yarns. Um, for the last two weeks, we've been on a buying trip, so we haven't been doing this podcast. Um, but today's guest, um, they've been an inspiration of mine for the last nine years. Um, I've been following their journey yeah, pretty much for the last nine years. They've been a massive influence in Melbourne streetwear and street brand. Um, do you guys want to tell us your names and tell us a bit about Itchpig? Sure. I'm Nate. I'm from Itchpig. Um and this is my brother, Alex. Yo. And we are the two creators of Itchpig. Nice. Um, just one thing before we start. What is, why do people call you Jerry? Jerry. Uh, okay. So <laughs> when we first started, um, we wore balaclavas in every interaction with the customer. And it was about the garments selling themselves, not the faces behind them. So we were working at a mum's garage, sewing these, these custom hoodies up, right? So people would literally come to the garage and buy these hoodies and pick up their hoodies and we would still be wearing the balaclavas. But to go a step further, um, we all had fake names. So you're like like strippers or something. Jerry, like, you know, come help me out, get me the thing over. So, you you know, you couldn't use each other's names because you're wearing masks. Because it was about the garments selling themselves, not the faces behind it. We didn't didn't want the clout. We wanted the product to speak for itself. So his name was Francis Bacon. Yeah. Yeah. Because so, I was at art school at the time. Oh, so. yeah. And mine was actually Hamish at the time, which was weird, but it later turned into Jerry Swinefeld, which was, is a play on Jerry Seinfeld. Yeah. Was there any meaning behind the fake names that you made up? Well, they both, obviously Bacon because of Pig, and Francis Bacon was one of my favourite painters at the time because oh, I was yeah. at art school. So that's why we did Francis Bacon for me. And then, yeah, Jerry Swinefeld for Nate. Um, swine. Swine flu. We used to write swine flu on a lot of garments. Yeah. As like a spread. It was like a, uh, a plague that was spread through pigs. Because that was actually when, you remember the, like swine flu was like the original COVID, right? <laughs> we're yeah. getting too, we, I think we're getting too coded for no. Tyler. Yeah, no, this is cool. <laughs> no, I, no, I no. Because I mean, this is like. This was about, I, I yeah. didn't know this. Let's deep dive into This that. brand, this is a weird brand. It was a weird yeah. brand at the start. So this is pretty much from the start. No, it's not, it's not that. It's just we overthink <laughs> everything. Yeah. Everything like, you know, like. No, we just wanted everything to be different and unique. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Unique, yeah. the one, the itch. It's it's a one. It's a unique brand. It's a really w- unique brand. And from the start, the way that me and Nate sort of think about things was quite differently to how other people think about things. Because every everything we touched, we changed. Like like you know, the classic story is is the sizes. Like they used to be based around basketball positions. Like we didn't have a small, medium, and large. We had point guard, shooting guard, small forward, power forward, center, because. Yeah. The sizes we created, we felt were so unique and different that shit. We'll give them their own names. Yes, yeah, so was the reason why you called them all the like the basketball names was because mm. of your size, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, yeah. we yeah, just yeah. thought our sizes weren't conventional size grades and size yeah. systems because we made them up. So we we're like, well, let's give them um, the sort of size grades that people that would wear them would be, which was basketball players because that's what we were. So we're like, well, our sizes are massive, so let's use PG as our small. Let's use C center. Because because on the basketball co- on the basketball court, a yeah, point guard right. is the yeah. smallest person, the biggest person's a center. Yeah. So we just base the the positions around that, the the sizes around that. Yeah, that's mental. Yeah. That, so how was it when you so you made all these different sizes? You came up with all these um crazy designs. How was it like cut and sewing your first ever garment? Like, because it would just be like so hard. <laughs> we it was nuts, yeah, so especially yeah. it like was nuts. It was crazy. We like, learned everything from just taking things apart. We yeah. were just like your, your your classic sort of DIY person out. The and that was like, that was out of necessity because, like I've I've said this previously, like this is 2010. We're talking here, you know, like we're in Mum's garage. Mm. We've got these crew, this dead stock crew necks that we bought off a manufacturer who still is our manufacturer today. Um, and we're just chopping and changing stuff, you know, mm. getting inspiration from kicks, from basketball colorways. And yeah, we had to learn because, you know, YouTube wasn't, is what it, it wasn't what, what it was, what it is now. Yeah. Well, there's only pretty much Facebook and that mm. was only on the up and coming yeah. back then. Yeah, yeah. So exactly. You to, like, I guess you had to do like learn everything yourself. Well. Literally. Yeah, we, just bought, we just, you know, similar to you, we'd, we'd buy dead stock items, um, things that our manufacturer couldn't sell and we just ripped them apart. We'd you know, unpick all the stitches, turn them back into their original form, which is just cut and sew panels. Um, and then we just put it back together and we just do that for two years. 
Did you guys know how to actually do that though? Or like, did no. you learn how to learn how to actual cut and sew so like randomly? Our, or did we didn't have good clippers or? or, you know, unsnippers or anything like that. We'd just use scissors and Stanley knives. And so. then we learned what an unpicker was. And then, <laughs> you know, at, yeah. at, at first, you know, I was kind of in charge of chopping up panels and getting them prepared for Alex to then sew them. But then, you know, eventually we made, we sold enough. Like we made, basically, you know, we started this thing off because we came back from Japan kind of wanting to bring a new type of fit and, 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 and style to for us because we felt like it wasn't here. There wasn't products on the market that we could buy that we liked the fit of. So we thought, fuck it, let's just make our own. And that's what we did. Um, and then we started wearing them around and people were like, oh, what the hell is this thing that you're wearing? We're like, oh, you know, we actually made it. Um, was and that so because they're like outrageous colors or just because they're dif- like a different shape? Both. Yeah. Well, I mean, we wanted to make clothes that like worked like sneakers. And the sneakers that we liked were pretty outrageous. You know, we were always into Air Maxes from yeah. the sort of early 2000s. And, you know, Air Maxes traditionally were, you know, wild colorways, right? Because mm. you want your sneakers to be pretty flashy. So we were like, rather than just wearing black, white and gray and then crazy sneakers, let's, let's put together some crazy colorways up top as well. So that's why our hoodies were so loud because, you know, they'd be, you know, yellow, purple, black Lakers colorways or they'd be, you know, Miami Dolphins colorways, teal, orange and, you know, a little bit of white and some chrome. Like they were pretty crazy, crazy sort of colorways. And so I think that's why people sort of started recognizing them as being, um, you know, pretty flashy and wild. And yeah, that sort of pushed I guess them. like pretty unique as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. well, you can see it now. Like, yeah. like that's a weird colorway. Yeah, like but it all have, works. Yeah, but it works. Yeah. And, that, yeah. and that's literally a, a result of making these one-on-ones. We learnt colours that could go together that you wouldn't normally think could go together. Yeah. And because we were, we're not going to some manufacturer or buying the stock from somewhere else, we're literally creating our, our own things because we had the technical skills, not great technical skills, but we had the skills to do it. You know, like he could sew and then I would get the stuff ready for him. He would sew it and then eventually – we sold enough of these things that we bought an overlocker and then, you know, the technical skill went up even more. So then I kind of became the overlocker, um, getting things prepared and whatnot. And then Alex would do the kind of final, like refined detailing, you know, the stuff that actually needed skill. You know, I was basically a butcher on that, yeah. on that overlocker. Um, and that's how it kind of went. We just learned and learned and learned and learned. So pretty much in this two years, was there anything like any massive thing that like made you get your name out there? Because uh, like, you said you're growing heavily over this two years. Social media at that start, yeah. like I mean, we started on Facebook, um, and so every customer that came to pick up their order, we'd do a photo shoot with them, and everyone would have the balaclavas on. And then when you posted that, you'd tag that person in, uh, and then it would spread sort of pretty virally through that. And I mean, also basic dem- demand and supply. There was one of these. There was only one. Oh, it was so, was, sold. so it was all one of ones. One, one of ones. ones we didn't make the same same hoodie twice for two years. Yeah, yeah. We, so the customer would get a photo in it and the supply wasn't one at that point. The supply was actually zero. So demand was just bonkers, right? And then people would be like, oh, is this going to be restocking yeah. soon? Or yeah, yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Did you have a lot of that? It. But it's, yeah. it's like the concept you have in, 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 your, in the shop, you know, yeah. except we were producing the stock. Yeah, we weren't right going right. on buying trips and, and, and like if we had an imagination for something, we would create it. Mm. We, we, we were creators of our own product. Well, that's like true creation, I guess. In a way, yeah. Like, I, I don't know. We, we, like, yeah, we just kind of did it and we kept going. And, and also you got to remember, like, for every one of these things we sold, there's one of these things walking around in the world. Yeah. And all these people see it, their friends see it, and they go, well, what the hell is that? Mm. So, And supply's still zero at that point. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so, so it's that like- That person's saying you can't get it. So then that's continuing to spread. So demand's continuing to go through yeah. the roof. So every time, you know, you sell one of these things, you, you, you would get- five more people coming back saying i want one yeah well it's like supply and demand it's like when people can't get something they want it even more you know what i mean exactly and before we knew and before we even knew what supply and demand was (laughs) like we didn't know what that was we were just doing what we wanted we wanted to make one colorway and one colorway only and that maybe came from an art practice of mine you'd only make one painting yeah so we just make one we put all the effort and all the sweat and energy we had into just making one it would sell and then and it's 2010, yeah. like there's, 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 like right now there is so much literature and, 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 and just stuff out there about how do you run a business, what marketing is, how do you make a product, how, what, how does Instagram, work? there's all this stuff already out there. In 2010, there's none of this, like yeah. none of this existed. So what we did was, was we focused on product. 
That's yep. where we started. We made a product. And then once that product started kind of getting out into the world, well, then we worked on how to advertise that product a little bit better. And then once it started growing even more, then we started thinking, okay, how do we make this a bit better of a system where we're not on the machines? Yeah. So then we started preparing the garments and then sending them to a subcontracted sewer who would then put them together and then we would handle the logistics and then you start figuring out the logistics and it just grows. We were learning how to do, how to run a, bi- a clothing business kind of almost department by department yeah. over those first two years. Well, as, yeah, like as you grow, you're just like going from one stage to the next and you you're just like, figure oh, out now, we, the, now yeah. we can't do that anymore because we're too big and then it's like, oh, now we've got to get someone to do that and we've got to get someone to do that. Yeah, that's um, how it grew. Yeah, so how like, what has been the most like difficult things in the last like 10 years? while you've been growing i mean giving up custom yeah that was pretty tough that was pretty tough that was probably at about year four or year five it sort of just flat out just outgrew um you know doing one a day then doing five a day then doing you know 50 a week then 100 a week then 150 a week custom one of ones <laughs> you know people coming through the warehouse in tottenham you know having a tour to then create their custom that would take half an hour an hour yeah, so you know that stock room. Mentioned. You know that stock room you have. Yeah, ours was like. Yeah, I've been to your Tottenham store. Oh, yeah. Well, you, you remember the custom room, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I've been, there, I've been there before. You remember so all the crates and the cartons and shit yeah, yeah, and yeah. The, the parts everywhere? Like, yeah. it so was doing nuts. that process with people walking around that, grabbing a sleeve, then grabbing a hood, then grabbing, you know, and treating it like separate pieces. Doing that up to 100, 150 customs a week, we decided that there's we saw similarities. People would want, say, a Mighty Ducks colorway. Yeah. And we'd have to just make all the thousands of different variations of that because we still didn't want to make the same hood twice. And we were like, let's just pick the best Mighty Ducks colorway and let's make 100 units of just that one. Yeah, so you just got a bit more smarter, I guess. So once we created a ready-made line, that's when we realized, okay, some of these particular colorways are really strong and that's when we sort of started heroing them for our brand and that's when we were like okay we there's more to this brand than just custom color block paneling um there's the fits there's the logo um there's more things to our products that people want it's not just the custom aspect so that's when we opened up a ready-made line so pretty much yeah so do you reckon you'll ever go back to one of one customs yes yes it's coming we're so working on it. Yeah. So how do you reckon that's going to work moving forward? No fucking idea. No idea. Yeah. It'll, it'll be an app-based um, yeah. thing, like a Nike ID concept. Because I see what you're doing now is like you're even getting the embroidery done, like custom embroidery within like yep. two weeks or whatever. Yep. Yep. Like, so that's our first step is to try to get um, custom branding activated yep. on our set silhouettes and our repeat styles. And then after that, we w- we're going to see how that goes. Um not from a sales stance because we know it's going to be really well received. More from a logistic stance. How's it get the back end going to go? Is it going to? Yeah, that's why. How does it? Yeah. How do you actually? And and this is, this is something that, we, again, we're going to have to figure this out because I mean, frankly, no one's doing this. Yeah, they're, they're, no one is doing what we're, we're what we're thinking about kind of bringing back into the brand. No one was doing it then, and now no one's doing it now. And that's and at the new scale of the business, doing it at the business's current scale, that's going to be challenging. But we, I mean, there's a reason why throughout our factory, the, fir- the photos of the garments we made in the first two years are, are littered throughout the walls of the factory because both me and Nate are really proud of that first two-year period of the brand and it's always in the background and all of our customers know about that period and I think they're all just hanging for when it does come back into the brand yeah. and it will. Um, there's just a lot of pieces that got to move in the background to get it happening. Yeah, especially while you need like drop down menus for everything. Um, oh yeah, like not even that, but that, that's that's, that's where you're th- where you're thinking yeah, that's is a, like a that's little. that's probably twenty steps. There's twenty things that need to get sold before that. Like yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, you might, ha- need, you might need ten rolls of fabric in twenty oh, true. Colors, $25. Yeah, dollars. yeah. I mean, that's just about fleecy. What if people want? Where do you store fleece? it? How yeah. do you take the order? Who who actually puts the thing together? Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> if this is a colorway, what's the thread count rule? Mm. Like. Do you put the same color on the top panel as the thread thing? Like, there's millions of things. Yeah, because I'm just thinking as a customer as well. I'm not thinking as a person. The <laughs> customer part is the tip yeah. of the iceberg. Yeah. You've got to go right back to say, if I take this sale, how do I make it happen? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you might, we might need to set up a manufacturing, like um, many manufacturing, in your manufacturer, area. yeah, yeah. That's yeah. probably the only way you could really 
do it, I'm guessing. Possibly, and yeah. have raw raw ingredients like fabric ready to there for cut and sewing, and then and then you you know and team of machinists to put it all together. And then you're talking about more wages. You got to spend money on sewing machines. You got to spend money on having fabric sit there. Like these these yeah. implications, and to fuel something that like that that I think will go. I mean, pretty bonkers, I reckon. I reckon it'll go bonkers, yeah. Um, so. That's a serious outlay of cash. Yeah. And then, you know, obviously we're self-funded, so it's like, where does that cash come from? Yeah. I was like, where are we taking that cash from? To yeah. Get it, to you understand how it works, yeah. right? It's pretty much. Got to like, pull it out of something. Yeah, got to pull it out of something or stop yeah. something to make them. Yeah, it's a bit um, crazy. But going back to your story, so you said you're in Japan. Yep. Like how, how did you pull inspiration from Japan? Japan Japanese people are the most regimented, diligent and consistent people, generally speaking, that I've ever come across. And I think that's what sort of took me and Nate's own inspiration. And that's sort of what we brought back was that hunger and determination. Um, and that's what the pig in the brand really is. It's, it's sort of to chew through anything, meat, flesh and bone, and just get through anything. Um, to realize that one goal whatever your one focus on you know the itch the one in japanese whatever you're focusing on like it's like it's i don't know it's it's like deadly it's like you know it's it's a weird example of it for me is literally i remember because we were snowboarding i was snowboard instructor we were snowboarding over there together we'd sit on the chairlift going up the park lift in hakuba and you just see these japanese guys just fucking hucking themselves off these jumps, just hucking themselves, killing themselves. 34 kickers, yeah. J- just killing oh, yeah. themselves. And the booters there was, at the time, so skinny and so lippy, they were scary as hell. Mm. And they would just throw down, spin to win, and they'd, like, they'd just, mm. they'd pancake themselves over and over and over and over and over again. You'd watch them all day killing themselves. And then one time they'd land it, and you're just like, oh, my God, these people like us on crack. They were just, just, they were just re- resilient. They were really resilient. And me and Nate knew that we had an element of that as well um, because we both were pretty determined ourselves to sort of do whatever we wanted to do. Well, and I mean, when you we know. went over there, it, sort of, it really highlighted to us that, yep, that's the ingredient that both me and Nate have. That's what we both possess. Let's put that together. So that was the one concept, the itchy. Um, and let's just put that creative energy together as one. And when we get back to Melbourne, let's... Um, put that into something and we decided it to be clothing yeah so australian made clothing australian too made clothing, which yeah. is crazy so what so does the pig have any meaning in japanese or is it so it just means one then pigs just the pigs just the best what it was just the best way we could come up with a singular word to describe how he and i like if you literally put any obstacle in front of us uh, i mean for lack of a better word it's we just, just hunger yeah hungry. it's just hunger hungry. hunger hungry. relentless hunger. yeah just so get yeah. through it so in Japan, you're making crochet I was, beanies? Yeah, yeah I was crocheting well. beanies. Yeah. So that's where it all started. That's where the, the concept started. And I still don't understand. I never asked you this. Why did you all of a sudden say, oh, let's do something with this? I never, I never got it. It's such a random thing. Mm. <laughs> well, I mean, I could always... Sew. I sort of started sewing at like 14, 13 or 14 or something like that. So I could make my own clothes. And then you were crocheting three panel beanies for the people we were living with in the town. So you, Nate was sort of making these one-of-one, three-panel striped beanies. And then I could sort of replicate those colours and those styles in, like, hoodies and crewnecks. And then um, I suppose it was just the coming together of both of those um, two sort of product ideas that sort of sparked the idea of, okay, well, let's do it in clothing. Um, we kept the beanies going. Yeah, for ages. I was yeah. crocheting the beanies for ages, but then I, I you know, I quickly realised that crocheting a beanie for three hours is not a great s- expenditure of time. <laughs> so then we actually got our grandma knitting the beanies. The gra- our grandma knitted yeah. the beanies for a very long time. Like, I'm talking, she was still knitting them in year six. She probably, kni- she probably knitted, yeah, thousands Yeah, so hot tip, though, if yeah. you've got a beanie from <laughs> us for the first six years, it was made by our grandma. Shit. Yeah. She was a demon sewer. Demon. Yeah. I mean, sorry, demon yeah, knitter. Yeah, yeah. How, just, how long would it take her to do a beanie? I reckon she'd knit them out. She'd bang them out in an hour, an hour and a half, just watching, watching yeah, the footy or the cricket, because she, she could do it like this. One a footy match. You know, she, she could. Said she, she could do one a footy match. It's crazy, yeah. insane. And then she made the balaclavas as well. All those old balaclavas. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. Like we, we, we made we. So she was doing the knitted ones, but then also, 
we started then manufacturing our own, coming up with patterns and coming up with, because you know the first, the first line of ready-made hoods and the customs used to have sewn balaclavas in the neck of them, yeah. so you could rip the ba- yeah. balaclava over, and so we came up with a way to manufacture that, mass manufacture them, so that we could just sew them into the hoods as we needed them. Yeah, that's crazy. If, so any, if anyone jumps on marketplace and sees a hoodie with a green polar fleece balaclava sewed in the neck, that'll be like. The OG. first, the first one, and if the inside of the pocket lining of the hoodie is green as well, that'll be the first edition. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So you pretty much went from Japan. You moved back to Australia. Um, you got a, got a warehouse. You brought a wa- warehouse, or no? Uh, we did. Two, we we came back. We did two years in the garage. Yeah, mum's garage. garage yep. Yeah, yep. five hundred bucks. Um, bought the garage space off mum. She pretty much got all of her stuff out of there, and the other five hundred bucks first. Uh, bought around 50 to 100 dead stock crew necks. Yeah. Um, crazy colours, blues, yellows, stuff that the manufacturer couldn't sell. And then we turned those um, those blank sort of dead stocks into the cu- first round of custom one-on-ones. How long did it take you to sell all those um, those um, dead stock hoodies? Not very long at all. Yeah, not long. I, I remember going back to him within yeah. a couple of months even. Maybe six months. Well, we really quickly realised we needed some beiges, we needed some blacks, some greys, yeah. some whites. We needed yeah, yeah, more yeah. blenders because we had a lot of, um, you know, no. we could do Lakers and we could do... Um, Your yellows and purples yeah. and stuff. Yeah, but, but not everyone wants crazy shit, no. you know? I mean, I mean, that was one of the biggest the biggest things that we realised once it started scaling out in Tottenham, once we got there, um, was we just keep chewing through the black and the grey. Mm. Yeah. And the navies, it just we just it destroy it because everything based around those colours. Yeah, well, everything everyone likes basic, you know. For everyone, sure, everyone needs like a basic hoodie. Yeah, they don't want to always be standing out as well. Well, we yeah, had, we had some people. This is when we really learnt that we had more to the brand than just the contrast colour yeah. blocking. Was we had people spending the same amount that a mm. normal colour block one would be, but they'd ask for it all to be black, but all the panelling still had to be there, yeah. as if it was oh, a, like a, a traditional. Basic itch pig panelled custom hoodie. Yeah. But they wanted all the panels black. Mm. And we're like, why do you want that? And they're like, well, I want the itch pig fit. I want the itch pig quality. I want it made in Australia and I want it to be custom made by you blokes. Mm. But I kind of want it all to be black. I don't want it to be colourway. And that's when we realised, well, okay, if we just made exactly what that person ordered, but all black with no panelling, we could sell it at a lower entry margin price point to the consumer we could make an actual run of them. We can still make them in Australia. Um, and that would satisfy everyone's need that just wants an itch big hoodie, itch big quality, itch big fit, but all black. And be a part of the brand as well. Yeah, absolutely. So you're pretty much, when you're building in your mum's like garage, um, it was pretty much all just word of mouth or Facebook or... So yeah, I, I, it was too, It was the word of mouth initially. Yep. Um, like I said, you know, like our spread was through word of mouth like Alex and I are obviously the, the middle of the circle we are the creators of Vintage Pig you know we're producing product that's specific to us um, so then it sells to our friends and then their friends and then it starts growing and then we start you know kind of uh, I don't know at some point basically what happened was is I had a Facebook page um, that I turned into Itch Pig and you had to add this Facebook page to, to cop one of these jumpers yeah. you know shopify and all that stuff doesn't really exist back then um like a facebook book group or something like that. it wasn't even no. a group it was literally a personal page oh. you could literally yeah. you could send a friend request and if i knew who you were i would accept you if i didn't know who you are i'd deny you it was that simple i can we controlled the supply for the first two years well for a very long time very regimentally um and yeah you just kind of put the order in and we just start ex- ex- kind of going from there that's kind of how, how it worked so it was mainly friends and friends of friends yeah yeah and then it started getting to the point where you had people that you didn't know or you know like you get recognized or yeah it kind of just started spreading from there it was pretty it was pretty sick to be honest yeah it was a really fun time um you get you know a kid from um brunswick high or like you know a local school and it might be one of the more popular kids and then all of a sudden he's a niche big or she's a niche big and then just you know, exploded. Then, get, then the whole school, yeah. literally in four weeks, would be placing orders. It was so days. weird watching it. Like, like I remember it got into St. Bernard's in, in um, East Keelor and it just went nuts, like mm. crazy. Like, it was, it, was, it was like a virus. 
We used to call them hubs. It yeah, was, yeah, we did. There'd be these these particular people in Melbourne that were really like hubs, and they had their own huge circle around them. And as soon as that person purchased, you'd just be like, "How come every single order is coming from you know Campbellfield now?" It's, it's the start. It's the, it's it's literally the start of the influencer concept. Yeah. Yeah, it really it, is. It really was. Yeah, pretty. That pretty much happened at my school as well. <laughs> yeah. Actually, there you so go. So joke. we're not talking crap. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. pretty much, I, I went to school in Werribee, and um, okay. oh no shit, I didn't know you were from Werribee. Yeah, so pretty much um, from Werribee. Now Sick. I'm from, but um, yeah, pretty much once it was pretty much HP all, all around the school, and, <laughs> and that's why we had. That's why a lot of our garments were branded with the term swine flu. Yeah, because it was kind of spreading like um, a virus. Like the uh, swine flu that like was around at the time, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's why there's some early, there's actually some early snapbacks and some early t-shirts that have a little tag on them. That says Even those crewnecks. Flu. Remember we made those crewnecks that had swine flu? There's that plum mm, one. There's a plum one with a gold and, and, and black embroidery on it. And um, there was that oatmeal that one. one. Yep. I remember that plum one. Yeah. yeah. There you go. <laughs> See? Yeah, that was yeah. a cool one. So you pretty much um, grew in the garage and you moved to Tottenham. Yeah. How was yeah. that? Why, why did you move? A dog died. Just like, oh. Yeah. Oh. A dog died and it was February. So random, isn't it? It's so weird. Like I was literally about, I was thinking about, he's going to ask, why did we move to Tottenham? And I'm like, I, we can't say our dog died it's again. There. We keep saying it. but It's it, literally what it was. Our dog died. It was the first 40 degree day of that summer in yeah. February. And me and Nate were burying our dog in the backyard of our digging the hole garage. Digging together. the hole in sweat and tears. It was our first family dog. Yeah. We were bawling our eyes out. We were pretty I'm upset. Like 18, you're like 20. We were so, so, so shattered. But we're digging this hole to bury our dog and we look at each other like, dude, we got to get out of here now because all I can think about is the dog in the backyard now. And life's life's too short. Let's give it a crack. And, but still at this, at this, at that same point, like, you know, like we we were pretty frugal up to that point. And then like, you know, we were prepaid on our phones. We owed our phones. We were spending next to nothing. You know, we'd go up to the snow We'd scab f- food out of the restaurants and stuff. Like we'd pay for spray, nothing. Spray, spray every single road sign on the way. Oh up. my god! Instead of getting to the snow in four hours, we'd get there in seven because we'd stop at every single road sign and and bomb it with each big <laughs> Yeah, yeah. We took spray <laughs> cans with us and shit. Like we almost got busted so many times, so many times. One like one time we literally saw the ranger coming down. And I was standing on the opposite of the car, end of the car and he pulled up and said, you guys all right? And our hands were covered in spray paint. The stencil was under my feet. I was just on the other side of the car and he couldn't see. I was like, yeah, yeah, all right, mate. And he, he kept going. Was the art scene more for you from like your side? Um, like, yeah, I suppose. Like graffiti uh, and art? Yeah, I mean, I did, um, I was a painter. So I did painting at VCA. Yeah. And um, in my final year where they get you to do, you know, a business practice or something, we decide we were already doing HP at the time, and we decided, oh, you know, let's let's use the final year of my uni to to um, do HP as well. Um, so that's where it sort of really pushed, um, and that's where a lot of some of the green came from. A lot of the green sort of, I mean, I painted like skin undertones with green, so we sort of like used a lot of that green to like push green into the brand, and we thought. Green meant go, me and A to go, go get us. So we're like, fuck it, let's do green. So that's how the green branding came in. On your logo? Yeah, yeah pretty much. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. I mean, if you look at like, yeah, I've got paintings at, at home and stuff. And yeah, if you scrape away at the skin tone, it's all painted green underneath. Yeah, that's cool. So yep. when you moved into this Tottenham store or whatever, was it like financially hard for you guys not spending a lot of money when you're in the garage? Or It was scary as all shit. We I had a bit I, of bankroll yeah, right. from like the two years of customs. Yeah. A little Especially bit, but had no idea what to do with it. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. But again, like I'm not going to, I'm not going to like, we're talking the rent. There was 1800 bucks a month. Like it was absolutely nothing. Like most people pay more at their house right now than that. But were you guys working at this point? Like while you're working in the garage? No, nah, we, we self sufficient from Mitch Peak. Once we got to, once, once we got to Tottenham, we were both full time. I mean, yeah. like Alex has never actually had a job. I'm jobless. <laughs> Perfect. This yeah. is his first and only job. And Unemployed. I, I was I, I had an industry based learning gig at an animatronics company through my uni, through my honors, which I yeah, I ended up quitting. The general manager was like, Yeah, you, you should go do itch big and I was like, Okay. And it's probably it's worked out pretty good. It's probably like in the top three decisions of my life, to be honest. So it was pretty scary moving into the Tottenham store. What it was to- it was it was 
scary in a sense that we were we were financially tied to something for the first time yeah. in our lives. That was so the man. scariest thing. Yeah. We'd never been attached mm-hmm. to anything before that ever. This space was scary because, I mean, we were. I mean, the, the garage was literally like three by four meters. Like it was tiny. It was smaller, smaller than this. Smaller in this room, mm-hmm. and we had you know us and maybe one other person, two other people in there, like cutting you know jumpers up and stuff like that. It was crazy. So we were pretty scared of the the space, the size of the size and scale of the space was pretty like um, daunting. Like, what are we going to use all these rooms for? We're paying for these rooms. Like, do we need to grow into these rooms right now? Can we chill? Like, so the space was pretty scary, and it was a pretty dingy, pretty. I mean, you've been to Tottenham. Yeah, yeah. That's like a pretty a, dingy area. And the way to get to your even because I was a kid back then when I went, sure. I was like, you had to get the train and then you had to walk like 20 minutes. You yeah, know? that was a proper walk. It's pretty sketch. And you're right along the Tottenham line and yeah. like the Tottenham yards are there. So it's a pretty like convoluted little and area. And it's very like um, industrial. It's not yeah. like a sort of like storefront, but yeah. like it's a destination, I guess. For sure. It was back then. It was a gnarly destination. Yeah, gnarly destination. <laughs> pretty gnarly. I can't, like looking back on it, I can't believe, like it just shows you <laughs> How to me, it, yeah. To to me, it shows the power of our product that yeah. we made people travel out to that fucking place, that mm. shithole of a place. You'd rock up on a Saturday to open the store, and there'd already be kids there. It's ten a.m. The like, best. How did you get these? Like, we caught the eight a.m. train from Collingwood. <laughs> the best. The best was when we would go and do our logistics runs because you know, again, back then, like, like logistics isn't what it is now. You know, like we'd literally go to the Oz Post and buy prepaid satchels yeah. and write out every single person's name on the parcel hand by hand then send off the tracking numbers and stuff one by one but you drive to the you drive to the post office and you'd see people walking and you're like they're for us yeah. Yeah. you could pick it every time because you know big the, backpack ready to stuff full of clothes and like kids and snap yeah you know it's like this 16 yeah. 16 year old person walking down sunshine road which is you know full of truckies and you know, cab drivers and, yeah. and stuff. And yeah, to put it in perspective, there's no one on that road, pretty much. No. no. Or there's nothing on that road. No, it's there is nothing. It's like abandoned warehouses and yeah. like... It's pretty ghetto, let's yeah. be honest. Yeah. It's yeah. pretty it's a pretty rugged place. So pretty much, were you still cut and sewing at this point? Like both of you guys were still doing we're all that? We are still like, doing a lot of custom through Tottenham. Yeah. We were doing custom, but we were, we were physically off the machines by about, I'm going to say 12 months in. We yeah. figured out pretty quickly that... While at, while at Tottenham. No, so in mum's garage. Even in the garage, we had to employ a a team of machinists. And that's what I was saying is is first, we figured out the product. We made a product that was desirable. It was unique. It had a unique selling point. And we figured that process out. The next process was, was how do we increase sales? And it was a two-pronged thing of improve marketing, but also get us selling more, i.e. get us off the machines. Because what happened was, is the demand went through the roof and we we just ended up spending all our days on the sewing machine. Yeah, it was like work in the business. Not, oh, work on the business. Not in the yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. then we, we kind we of literally couldn't make. We couldn't make. We couldn't take more orders because we couldn't make any more. Mm. So we 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 got a little bit of a mini team of machinists going. We'd pretty much pack the order, which would be like five to ten percent of the job, just getting all the parts and panels together. Cut it all up, get the right colors, measure it all up. You know, produce the middle panels, slice everything, and then. We roll call them bu- bundles. Yeah, we call them bundles. That's Custom right. bundles. And then we'd yeah. give the we'd, we'd drop like 30 bundles off to a machinist, drop another 30 off to another machinist. They'd spend the whole week making them, pick them up, done. Oh, yeah. So it became a lot more streamlined. Yep. Yep. That's yeah. how we could get to sort streamline. of like, stream. Like, like, like it was better than what we were yeah, doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was, as still, a business, it was still super manual. Yeah. Super manual. Yeah. So you pretty much had one staff... When you went moved to Tottenham, what was what was, so it was a store store person or no? It was actually so. I mean, it was it was this guy called Liam McGinley. Um, is funnily, he still no, with you guys or no? Nah, he's not still with us. He, he was with us for a very very long time though, and like it was literally like he he helped us with the custom and, and how it came about was he came to pick up a custom order one day and he's like, oh, do you do you guys need some help? And I was like. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, sure. He's like, well, you know, you tell me whenever you, whenever you need my help, I'll come and help. I said, you're free right now. He's like, yep. I'm like, cool. Here's some scissors. And I literally started getting him cutting. That's good ass. <laughs> yep. And then he became the kind of, it was funny how our, our knowledge and information on how custom ran slowly translated into him. And then he actually ended up surpassing us. Mm. He knew everything about it. And the way we paid him was literally he got to pay, make customs whenever he wanted. Oh, just p- paid him by hoodies. Mm. Pretty much. Yeah, <laughs> because until we could right. afford to pay. Properly, yeah. Proper yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It was like an internship. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
yeah, in a way for how to make custom hoodies. It was yeah. like a garment technician's internship. But he loved it because he was a sneakerhead. So, you know, like he could make some really specific yeah. colorways to match his. And, you know, he'd go out and he'd be wearing these kicks that match this really cool hoodie. He looked like a god, mm. you know, like, yeah. Yeah, like he just do whatever, yeah. Yeah, Tell so whatever fun. he wants. Yeah. So in this Tottenham sort of bit you are in with this warehouse, what are some things you sort of did differently, like to grow to where you are now? We've definitely pushed the ready-made thing. Definitely. Um, what really else? Massive growth through that period. Tottenham was the biggest growth. Yeah. yeah, that was that was enormous. Like we went from a garage thing to you know, I mean, living off it. Well, now, now it could hold stock, right? So we could yeah. order you know a couple hundred hoodies and actually have them sitting there and decide when we want to release them and how we wanted to photo them. And we had time to produce campaigns, and you know, we actually had capacity to um, you know do more than just create a great product. And our knowledge of garments became. Was, was exponential you know like you know alex obviously knows like an incredible amount but you know even me as someone that wasn't really on the garments i still i still knew quite a lot more than the average joe so you know you've got two high level problem solvers working on product we started you know it was that that kind of focus thing again of like we wanted to start wearing itch pig in as many situations as possible so you know summer comes along we need itch pig at the beach Okay, what do we need to do to fulfill that? We want to wear each pick at the snow. How do we fulfill that? And because we weren't on the tools anymore sewing, we actually had the brain capacity to just start problem solving some of that stuff yeah. and start producing, you know, really crazy outcomes. It's not actually that hard to produce stuff by yourself with your own hands. It, it's really hard to p- turn it into a tech pack yeah. and communicate that concept through to someone else, um, you know, at a manufacturer's. So but is it a lot easier, like being Australia made, like being able to go to the manufacturer and being like, oh, this is actually really well, yeah. rather than like sending it offshore? Yeah, yeah. yes, yes and no. Um, I mean, there are sort of um, barriers with manufacturing in Australia um, that you don't have offshore. Um, but generally speaking, obviously, we think we can produce a great product here in Australia. Um, so that's why we do it. Um, and we can actually see the machinists on the machine. We know how they're paid. We know mm. they're treated fairly. We can see their conditions. Like I literally walk into their lunchroom with them and, you know, see that they're all having fun. They're all laughing. Mm. They're all spending their lunches together. They get a good solid break. They get breaks throughout the day. Um, they have heaters at their feet. Like, you know, I get to see their working conditions. Um, so and that's they care great. about you as well. Absolutely. That, We're yeah. pretty popular there. That's what I mean. Like you go there and it feels like community as well, yeah. just even in your manufacturing sure. group. They ask us how things are going and, you know, we know things about their lives. They know things about our lives. Like I know what's happening with their dog and, you know, like it's it's a community. So that's great. And it makes them care about your product as well. Like when they're making it, they actually put an effort. Absolutely. Yeah. Especially because you got one of the highest quality like products as well. Yep. And it just like makes it a lot better. Yeah, they like working on it as well because they know when it hits the customer, um, it's at a price that um, reflects their craftsmanship. Yeah. Um, because the Australian-made um, industry, it, it kind of needs to run off a higher price point margin yeah. um, to sustain it. It really does need to be um, an high, a higher entry product. Um, the volume game is not sort of the game that, that this industry wants to run off. Yeah. Um, there aren't enough people on this country um, to sustain a high volume game. Um, so they like that we um, put a lot of design into our products so that we can um, achieve a higher price point. Yeah, and, and quality as well. Yep. Like you can even tell in your hoodies are a lot higher qualities than something that's going to be like sent from For sure. offshore or something like that. You know what I mean? Well, products, products, what me and Nate know at like at our core, we, that was the start of That's the business. That's the start, yeah. Yep. Yep. I could make things look good and, and Nate coming from um, industrial design could make things work. So we could always produce um, a really good product. So we've never we've never um, tried to stray away from that. So we just focus on produce the best product we possibly can, um, make as much goods here that you can, um, and then yeah, the rest we sort of figure out after that. Yeah, for sure. You are talking about snowboarding just before. Do you reckon, reckon snowboarding had a massive influence in... It's big. Had an influence on the fits. That's on the fits. Sure. Yeah, yeah, huge. We base. I mean, I feel like um, that whole you know that whole line about you know how Elvis just 
he just basically um, reappropriated, you know, the, you know, black music, you know, yeah. the blues or Eminem did the same thing. We just reappropriated snowboard culture pretty much. Like, well, I mean, it was as simple as it's cold. <laughs> so one way to warm up is to wear larger clothes because there's more fabric. So you're wearing more raw material on you. So you're going to be warmer. Yeah. So that was the main reason why we dressed two, three sizes too big for us when we were snowboarding. So we're like, well, Melbourne's a pretty cold place. Why don't we just adopt the same principles? So we just started wearing clothes that were two or three sizes too big for us in Melbourne as well. And then we were like, well, let's just, let's just make them. So that's why the fits were so massive for so long um, was came, came from snowboarding culture. Yeah. Well, because yeah, you see snowboarders wearing it like three XL. Exactly, you know what I mean. Yep. But yeah, so and that aligned with our basketball um, yeah. interests as well. So I was just like, pretty much your basketball or your sport. Yep. Um, and chat. that's yeah, that was the weird thing is like we we basically wanted to. I don't know. I feel like we just brought snowboard culture back with us, and that's how we decided to dress. And then that you know obviously influenced streetwear culture somehow. Not that I'm saying we influenced streetwear culture, yep. but like. We just did what yeah. we want. We just did what we wanted to do. Yeah, we've been making clothes that are too big for since the start. Yeah, like our biggest exchange that we get is when someone buys a large and they said I should have bought a medium. Yeah, yeah. Our clothes have been too big forever, and everyone knows that. But they're always going to be too big because we always bought clothes too big for us, and we always made clothes for each other that were too big. But everyone wants to wear oversized as well these days as well. Everyone well, yeah. comes now to the, everyone like comes into the trend, yeah. right? Everyone comes to us so oh, oversized tee. Yeah, exactly. it's, it's it's as simple as like like I'm not saying wear the genesis of tall baggy clothing. All I'm saying is is we wanted to dress like that. We didn't know where to buy that or ha- yeah. where to find that, so we made our own. Yeah, it's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. And then we found a commonality in our, in our customers that they were finding the same problem. They didn't know where to. F- where to purchase the goods that we were wearing so that they could look like us. Yeah, it's gap in the market sort of thing. Yeah. And so if there's something there, there's something there. But, uh, I mean, clearly there wasn't because otherwise me and him wouldn't be sitting here 12 years later. Yeah, exactly. But um, so pretty much you moved from Tottenham and you moved into a new warehouse space. Um, how was that? And yes. Was so, so you're talking about going from, yeah, Tottenham, from Tottenham to, to, to Brunswick. Brunswick. So I guess Tottenham. Tottenham, Tottenham, Tottenham. Well, Tottenham was, it was a pretty brutal working condition. Yeah. I mean, for starters, there's no windows at all. So that was pretty brutal. Um, through winter, we would get, you know, like chill blains on our hands because it was oh, yeah. so cold. And in the summer, it would be so hot. Um, and I think we got to the stage by about year six or year seven where we were like, we, we're a pretty established brand. Like we were, pretty established like you know alex and i by this stage are paying each other a wage yeah um we had staff as well we had yeah. staff you know we were we were functioning as what we thought was a brand like we thought we were a proper business so we thought if we want to become the premier business or aspire to be the premier business or brand of melbourne what the fuck are we doing here in tottenham yeah. <laughs> like we're in the middle of nowhere yeah um it's time to to, yeah, to, to to invest in something that can sustain more growth, more stock holding, um, more accessible, more accessible to more demographics. Put a, a cooler skate park in there, or a nicer design office. You know, like and be closer to manufacturers as well. Yeah, we, that was the other we thing. We're starting to go from doing you know a weekly pickup drop off to daily, so we needed to get close to our manufacturers. All of our manufacturers were north. Yeah. Um. So we decided to go north. Because, um, cause, uh, I mean, a lot of people don't probably realise this, but, you know, like, you don't just send an order off to a manufacturer, they produce it in the one spot and then it comes back to you. It, do- it doesn't work like that. It, you know, like, it gets cut, then it's got to go to branding. So then someone has to transport it from the first manufacturer that cuts it, then to the branding. And then the, it goes got to go from the branding back to the manufacturer. Now, if you repeat this concept over multiple garments, suddenly you're spending all day on the road transporting everything. That's why we got the each big van, yeah. because it was actually a function of necessity. We needed a van to transport because before that, it was our cars, you know. And you only can fit a certain amount of boxes. Well, yeah. it just got pretty sketchy, yeah. you know. Like once you kind of started doing more than 10 boxes, it was pretty sketchy having, you know, seven boxes. Because like, you know, like we would put the 
the box in the driver's in the in the passenger seat, and you'd look and you can't see. Yeah, like yeah. it became dangerous or whatever. So we were spending so much time on the road transporting everything around. We were like, well, yeah, it, it makes sense to kind of be closer to them. Mm. So that was another reason for for moving. Yeah, but it, like anything, you know, like you move and you have to figure everything out again. You know, like. Where does all the stock sit? How are we getting internet into all the rooms? Where's the office going to be? Are we going to paint the office? Let's put AstroTurf down on the office. Like, it was crazy. It was it was mental. How was yeah? How was like doing all that? Like pro like setting it all up? Because did you have any staff at this point? Yeah. One, just one, one, just one staff. Yeah. Well, it was, just, it was just AJ, wasn't it? AJ helped us with the move. With the move, yep, yep. yep. So you had one staff moving into from Tottenham to Brunswick. Yep. yep. We and you're moving into a way bigger space. Way bigger. We had to think about it way more. The the internet challenge was a big challenge. I act like the, the way the internet came into the into the warehouse, it came into the room that we didn't want to work out of. So then I had to figure out a way of how to feed the internet into where we were going to be working in. We had to figure out how to make because before we got in there it was a bed sheet manufacturer. And um yeah, the way it was set up was just not going to fit our business at all. The, and the the carpet in the top office was horrible. It was stained with wee from a dog before it and it was it was pretty horrible. So one of the first things we did was I think we spent a weekend with Eric, remember? Painting painting the office. We painted the whole thing like this this massive, what is it? It's probably what, four by ten meter room? Yeah, it's a big room. Just a lot of paint, a lot of yeah. AstroTurf. Yeah, got the AstroTurf. Yeah, a lot yeah, of look good. Just work. Did it make place up? when you're setting it up? Did it like because then you could start really like um, organizing your drops properly and st- like that sort of stuff and dropping a lot more. We or? were dropping, we were dropping heaps, but we were still manic. We were still not very scheduled. We were still only looking what a month or so ahead. Yeah, we ran probably a month ahead for probably yeah year six through to probably year nine ten. Yeah. Just only the last sort of two years, three years, been. we've had like a really structured um, range plan, drop. Yeah. drop plan. Like we're designed out till the end of June right now. Like do, you, do you reckon that was because of um, COVID? Like you guys got a lot more time to sit down or... and To be honest, we, we actually made a lot of... We actually made more money to invest in these systems and, yeah. and, 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 and employ more people, employ more structures and, and, you know, you come up with an idea and you can actually fund it. You know, we basically did really well out of COVID and, 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 and funded all that money back into the business to make us better. Yeah. And, you know, I feel like you can see it in the product and what we're dropping, you know, in terms of, you know, producing the ranges that we're producing still in Australia. It's, it's, it's pretty crazy. Yeah. Like I see how hard he works. And it's fucking mind numbing. It's crazy. <laughs> so you're pretty much the face of the company and you take care of all um, designs, tech back. Yeah, I sort, sort of run the creative team. So yeah. I run um, design, obviously I'm marketing. So the content guys. Um, I sort of run a little bit of sales as well, um, and then production. All self learnt. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, I haven't had a job, so, yeah, so I didn't <laughs> learn anything from that. It's on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm YouTube like yeah. fiend. Yeah, I think that's like most business people. They yeah. just learn everything on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. The bulk yeah. of my education would be YouTube. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. I'm sort of five to ten YouTube videos a day, sort of thing. Do you do any like courses or anything like that? No, to no, just YouTube. Everything. I taught him Illustrator and Photoshop, literally. <laughs> He didn't know how to use Illustrator and Photoshop. I taught him that because I learned that in my industrial design course. Yeah, so pretty much like I think we are talking about it before we even got on the podcast, but your um, content has been pretty clean cut from the start to now. Mm. Um, Yeah, do you want to walk us through it and like how it's been so clean cut for so long? Yeah, I mean that's sort of the inner struggle of sort of the itch and the pig in the brand because there is this pig aspect that is just hungry – now, 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 do, do, do. And then the itch, which we like to think is a little bit more refined. And we made a long a call a long time ago that we thought our content needed to swing to be a little bit more refined um, along with our product. So we took our product and our marketing over to sort of an itch mindset yeah. of sort of perfecting your craft, that sort of Japanese uh, master and skill. Um, and then we ran that for ages and it's only recently, maybe the last six months we've actually thought that maybe our marketing should swing back over to a more um, day in the life pig sort of mindset of you know document what's happening right now and post don't even think about it just document post document post 
Um, so our marketing might actually have a big change um, yeah. moving forward. The key there is though that he kind of he just kind of passed over was mastering your craft. Like we, we got epic at Photoshop, yeah. epic, epic at Illustrator, epic at like we just kept refining, 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 refining. It's that that Japanese regimented culture. Um, yeah, we just kept doing it and doing it and doing it and just learnt so many things. It was crazy. It's crazy how much we learnt on the job. Yeah, like you obviously just like get better and better. It's like more more that you sort of do it. Yeah, we just get a lot of reps in, you know, every yeah. single day, consistency, and we just do it a lot. And again, it's like when we started, it was 2010, so there wasn't really much literature and content out there on how to start a business. Like obviously there's big brands around like, you know, your Volcoms, Nike, Addy, all those, like they're all around. But like there wasn't all these owners – out there talking about you know like bobby hundreds wasn't exactly out there on youtube saying you know this is how i built it that exists now but back then there was none of that so it implanted in us from a very young age that we just gotta learn all this shit ourselves and it's just by doing you know it's like going right back you know when we were sewing stuff if i broke the needle on the overlocker i had to figure that out it wasn't youtube you know what do i do if my overlocker needle breaks and there's a you know Hundreds 50 of videos. 50 so. videos, right? There's nothing. <laughs> like, I had to sit there, like, figuring it out. Like, it was nuts. Yeah, and I think but I think it makes it more original for your guys' brand as well. When you first started, it was all, like, your thoughts, and this is, like, what our brand wants to be, rather than, like, now people take a lot of inspiration from, like, say, your guys' brand, a lot of other brands as well in Australia, mm. where it's, like, you guys were, like, original, you know? Mm. That's From awesome because like, that's like a, you know, it's like a root system, people stemming off. If there's brands out there and, and other owners of up and coming brands that are stemming off things that we've done over the last 10 years, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Because me and Nate think that, you know, we've just sort of been doing it more or less our way for the whole since time. the start. Yeah. And if other people um, think that might be the right way and they're sort of doing that as well. Or that's saying you do it, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. In the last 10 years, to keep up with the trends... How have you guys um, like weaved your way around it? I think we just keep looking in, in internally and as yeah, it's, to it's, what it's, products it's, we want. It's inwards. It's so need. simple. It's like fundamentally this business is not built on I want a clothing brand. I want the clout of saying I'm a designer. We, like like I said, we wore balaclavas and had fake names. Like you couldn't get further furthest from that. We did not give a shit about that. And we still don't. Like to me – you know, the first point was, is we wanted to make shit that we actually wanted to wear. So we just keep doing that. Yeah. So you're not like following any trends. You just want to, to even stay up to the times or are you just sort of um, doing what you guys I, I don't, I, I don't know. Like, I'd like to say yes, but at the same time, like for instance, we just released these cargos, right? They've yeah. gone crazy. We, 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 they've done so well, but we had, we designed those cargos in 2019. We've had them for three years. Like, it's like, and the trends just come up now. It's like, yeah, I don't know so how I don't so know how you explain that. Like, yeah. I'm not I'm not saying we're the creator of the trend, no, but at no, the same no. time, we didn't get that idea from somewhere else. We just said we want to make itch big cargos. And how, be- how was making itch big? Like, how was making pants and shorts with the manufacturing in Australia? Very difficult. Fucking like, gnarly. Yeah, it's insane. What Very is difficult. it like? Hoodies would be they're still pretty hard to even to get hoodies, but like, yeah, hoodies are cargos. Difficult. Jeans, because you guys are releasing shorts. Denim. Denim. Bottoms are the hardest. Yeah, yeah, bottoms are are tricky. Bottoms bottoms are something that we've been paying our dues on probably since year three or four when we first entered and we made those crazy chinos. Remember those chinos we made? And the the track pants. Yeah, we've been, I mean, we've been cutting our teeth on bottoms. We made our first pair of bottoms in 2014. So we're coming on to 10 years now learning bottoms. We've done a lot of different waistband constructions. We've done elastics. We've done half elastics. We've done belts. Um, we've done s- snaps. We've done a lot of different waistband Waterproof, uh, cotton drills, denim. Yeah. Yeah. We just... But it's funny. Now, I feel like streetwear as a whole, people are becoming more educated and I'm noticing people actually focusing on pants more. Yeah. People are com- starting to come in... Like, you know, I, I had an AFL player come through the other week and he bought four of our pants. I've never, I've never had, I'd never had that happen in my life. You know, like people usually buy four of our jumpers, sure. Yeah. But like he literally just bought four of our pants. And it's just like, I feel like all these, all these, um, all these Jews that we've paid 
in putting thinking and in, in improving our pants is starting to get recognized a little bit but yeah i mean producing pants is so tricky because people people's legs vary um so much to their tops you know like you got people with short chunky legs or short skinny legs you got tall people you got like it's just and then you got different fits you got different types of constructions you got different fabrics fake just, fly versus real yeah. fly we just early on I mean, recently we've sort of identified a waistband construction that we really, really, really like. And so that's the waistband construction that we're scaling out across our um, pant category. It's just sort of an elasticated belt system with, um, you know, an in- inbuilt sort of pull tab belt with two belt loops. And we love that construction. As a fake fly, it's really good, side hand pockets. So we're scaling out that waistband construction across all categories for pants. And that's sort of the way to do it. Um, if I was to give anyone advice I want to get into the pants game, it would be to identify um, an element of your pant that you really like and click the scale button as quick as you can. Yeah, for sure. Pants sound super hard to... They're really they're, tricky. Yeah. They're crazy. Yeah, yeah. And that's people it. don't realise they actually cost more to produce than top torso garments, yeah. even though... Well, there'd be like so many... Like compartments of it, like pockets. Yeah, I don't know all the detailing on it. All yeah. the all, yeah, shape like shape size. Yeah, shapes and different and and machines that you need. Like, look at all the. If you just look at a pair of look look literally look down at your pair of pants yeah. and look at all the different types of stitches on your pant, and you go, every single one of those stitches needs a machine. That's money that you have to invest. You have to have the person that knows how to use that machine. Like it's 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 bonkers. And good then a lot of the time well. we say that all right, let's let's show how good the craftsmanship is. So let's do a contrast stitch. And then everything's on show. You can't hide anything. Every yeah. bar tack needs to be millimeter perfect. Every stitch needs to finish on the right corner. Um, everything needs to be straight. Everything needs to be perfect because you've decided to do a contrast stitch. Yeah. So pants are hard. Pants are look very hard. Pants are hard. Um, you were talking before about footy players coming into your store. We were talking a bit before that we started the podcast about Sticky Fingers came into, coming into your store. My favorite band. Crazy. You got a bit of a story for us. Yeah, I mean that was, I don't I don't even know how that came up. Oh, that's how it came out. So we had this, there was like this event at, at um, a studio we're kind of friends with. They're called On Three Studios in Brunswick, um, and they were throwing this past the mic event or whatever. And we were going to sort out a couple of the artists who were playing in the event or whatever. And <laughs> they turned because you you do support a lot of like um, hip hop rap. Yeah, yeah we do um, yeah. with a. Uh, outfits i've been like look, looking at your blogs and stuff like that yeah, yeah we just think there's a lot of local artists that have they're also in the in the early infancy stages yeah. of sort of refining their craft and we just feel that it would be a great alignment if they were to wear something of the quality um that supported the quality of the art that the they're artists. doing yeah um and that's why a lot of sort of artists like um local artists like collaborating with us because I feel like they, the quality of what they're wearing now supports the quality of what they're producing as well. So yeah, yeah that's good. why we're sort of in that community. Yeah. And, and, and you know, our tagline is driven by independence, bound by community. So yeah. at some point you have to give back to the community and that's kind of one of the big areas of focus at the moment that we're kind of involved in, 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 in doing. So these, these artists kind of came through kind of and it was only meant to be three of them and quickly it turned into like this whole gang of like 20 people in our warehouse you know, skating and shooting hoops and stuff. It was just, it was bonkers. Anyway, so a couple of them I didn't realise were actually, they were um, the uh, supporting acts for Sticky Fingers. Yeah. And so like, I don't know what happened, but one of them said to me, you know, make sure you contact me tomorrow and, and, and make sure you get at me. And I was just like, okay, whatever, sure. And I was going to do it. But then later that night, he hit me up and said, yo, the Sticky Boys, they want some product or whatever. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. You know, whatever. So then, they, the Sticky Fingers boys were meant to come through the warehouse, but I think their schedule didn't line up and, you know, they were super yeah. busy. They had a show on um, at Festival Hall that night. And I said to I said to one of the guys, I said, look, I'm happy to sort it out, but only if we can go meet the boys. I, I, I want to, you know, shake yeah. their hands, talk to them, you know, say what's up, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, at, and, and what, what what had happened was is Jasper, our, our, our um, photographer, his friends had come along because they're like you, they really like Sticky Fingers yeah. and they thought they were going to meet him and then turned out they weren't going to come and they're really bummed about it. But I said, you know, stick with it. I think, I think, you know, we can figure this out. Anyway, so the artist comes, picks up all the garments. And I said, okay, let's go to the thing. And he's like, yeah, cool. So then we go to the thing, but I was like, I said to Jasper, I said like, well, let's pretend your friends are com- uh, photographers. 
and you know they're not photographers or whatever but we had a whole bunch of cameras <laughs> yeah, yeah. lying around <laughs> around the place right so we so before the guys come in to pick the clothing we give them these these cameras that yeah. don't work and put them around their necks and you know blah 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 so then we pick out all the garments we go off to festival hall and then i get there first with the, with the artist and we go in and sure enough, I'm backstage, they're doing sound check. They walk off and they introduce themselves to me and I start talking to them. And like, I was like, oh, okay, cool. And, you know. Tell the story of Jasper's friend. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm going to. So, so, so then Jasper, Jasper's still driving his friends. They're f- losing their fucking minds by this stage. They're fizzing their heads off because they, really like, they really like sticky fingers, right? So then <laughs> they turn up. Jasper texts me and says, um, all right, we're here. I've just parked. Uh, I was explaining to them how to get to Festival Hall. So I go out and say to security, oh, I'm just going to go get some media. <laughs> and, the, and the security guy goes, okay, cool. So I go get Jasper and his two friends who, you know, like they're 20 like, yeah. and they're young looking 20, go- 20 year olds. We walk up to the door and the security guard looks at me and I go, this is the media I'm talking about. He's like, you guys are photographers here. And they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so then we sneak him in and... And I didn't actually find out where the green room was because I had to go get Jasper and they kind of took off and disappeared. So I'm looking around we're in the, you know, festival hall down on the ground floor, looking around like, I don't know this, like I'd never been on the ground floor before like that. So then we walk to this door, we open up, it's this huge latrine. It's just like this big toilet. I was like, well, they're not in there. So then I, I see these set of stairs and I'm like, okay, let's go down there. So we walk down these stairs and we kind of get into this room and there, it looks like there's all these roadies around or whatever. And I'm like, okay, I think, I think we're getting close. And um, I'm just about to, and I can hear them talking now. And I'm just about to walk there. And this, this guy comes out and goes, who are you? Hang on, what the fuck are you? Who are you? And I'm like, oh, uh, uh, we're with Sticky Fingers, you know, like uh, go, go, ask, um, go ask the boys. They know we're coming. And I was just like, yeah, come on. Like I'm holding, I'm, I'm trying to oh, portray no. this confidence because <laughs> the boys by this stage are shitting Losing themselves. The shit. They want to fucking, they want to bolt. They're shitting themselves. He goes off and I hear him and yeah, I hear that. Yeah, yeah, bring him in, let him in. So then I come in. I bring all the product and sure enough, sticky fingers are in this huge green room, just chilling out and they're all ripping the product, try, trying it on, putting shit on and stuff. They're, they're loving it. And the boys were just like, oh my God, we're in the green room. Like they were just yeah, like, yeah. They're, they're shitting themselves. So then I, I kind of went off and chatted to them and stuff. And like the boys were hanging with Jasper and then sure enough, they're pretending to start taking photos and the cameras they had didn't work. Yeah, yeah. And like, it was so funny. It was like, so I got, I was... I was with Dylan and I don't think Dylan realized this at the time. I think, oh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if he cottoned on or not, but so I'm standing there with Dylan getting a photo that the lead singer, right? And, um, <laughs> and he's like, oh, do you guys want to get a photo? And, and, and Jasper's friends are literally taking photos with the shutter closed. Like the, they got the lens cap on. Lens caps on. <laughs> like it was, I'm sitting there trying to hold a straight face, like posing with this guy, knowing that these two guys... Their cameras don't work. They're busted. They're old busted D90s from, you know, Tottenham or whatever. We we burn through cameras. And so they've got cameras that don't work and they've got the lens cap on. It was hilarious. It was so funny. Like, it was so funny. And like, yeah, it was just just crazy. So yeah, I was just chatting with them and stuff and and we were just hanging out. and And then of course, you know, I think Dylan picked up on it. He's like, oh, do you guys want to come get it? And they, sure enough, they dropped the cameras, and kept, you know, got the photo with sticky fingers behind and, oh, it's crazy. It's the funniest story. It was crazy. And then, so we hung out with them and, and, and that, that, they were just fizzing it. It was just like, it was so funny. And then, so we walked out after that because they had to go get dinner and the boys were like, oh, that was the craziest thing I've ever done in my life. Like, you are. They were just going crazy. They, like, they were so fizzing. It was so funny. It was a crazy story. Yeah, that would have been fucking. That would have made. I'd be the like those twenty year old boys yeah. in that situation. Yeah. Eh? We snuck. We somehow we snuck him into the backstage just to key fingers. I don't know. It was the randomest thing ever. Yeah, it was it just was a classic Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> Random as. Um, what was so? You just did a pop up about a month ago with Sal's. Yeah. At Balaclava. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we have a pretty a pretty good long time relationship with Sal's. Do you We've do a no- bunch of collabs or is it? That was collab two with them. Yeah. Drop two. Um, have you done any others? Um, before that or uh, we've done we've done another drop of um, merch before that as well with uh, Souls or something with, with Souls yeah, yeah. Um, so we've done you know stuff with them quite a lot that, yeah they, they, I mean they're good boys they're similar to us you know building something out of nothing right yeah well it's, now they're pretty much a bit pretty like franchise now yeah sure. yeah yep. yeah they're killing it they're doing great they're doing great things you know like so many people come through now and are like you know yeah, I, I love those sandwiches, or I, I I'm sucker for the pastrami or whatever, right? Like, yeah. But yeah, we've done, 
We've done quite a few collabs along the way. Mm. It's crazy once you stop and think about some of them, you know, like we did one pretty big one with a pretty OG Melbourne street ass uh, mayo or mayonnaise. That was pretty sick. And yeah, we've done, we've done quite a few along the way. I don't know. It's just for us, it's about, you know, kind of giving back and supporting local and, and aligning with, with different artists and stuff. But we've got, we've got a few on the way. We've got mm. s- some plenty on the way. Yeah, we've got some ones with that artist, Ginklet. Um, can't yeah. talk about some of the other ones. Yeah. No, we so can't you just got a lot of good collabs coming out to summer. Yep, yep. There's yeah. a couple good. Um, there's like a brand to business in December. MSC is coming. Yep, there's a brand to brand in November, which is really cool. Maybe just to wrap it all up, so do you have any more collabs or like any more pop-ups, new drops for the summer? Like what's what's the business looking forward? Yep. Well, we drop for the next five years, maybe. Yeah, we drop fortnightly, so we drop twice a month. Yep. Um, Pretty big ranges, twice a month. Um, There's this big release um, on Wednesday, nineteenth of October, which is currently, which is tomorrow. That's for the Explorers full kits that we sort of been um, working pretty hard on for a long time. So that's a pretty good little drop. And then in November, so how how many items are in that drop tomorrow? Uh, is it eight SKUs? Eight or eight to ten SKUs. Oh, sure. Yeah, pretty big, pretty yeah. big little. Well, and and and, the, and sure. you know, this is obviously what I'm wearing is really technical. Yeah. You know, like you got a pair of shorts and this this super short sleeve shirt that we've never done before. You know, we had to. Mm. There's a lot of work in those. They were they were, they were fun to design. Um, and so they're different got, as well, and they're cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. something yeah. different. So yeah. we've got that drop um, this month, and then probably the hero drop of November will be the collab drop. Um, that I just blew. That you just blew, so we won't say the name. Um, <laughs> but that's a like an event activation um, in the twenty on the twenty sixth of November, so it's yep. a Saturday. Yeah, um, we're trying to do the whole we're not feeding into Black Friday too much thing. Yeah, yeah, like yep. a lot of brands, I think, are yeah. trying to do the same. Well, now. especially Australia made. It's absolutely terrible for the manufacturing industry yep. to just burn through stock like that. Yeah. Um, they really don't want us to do it because then they know we're just going to have to hit them up for like a huge restock mm. this side of Christmas, which will absolutely destroy their production capacity. So we just don't really want to be involved in it. Yeah. Um, it's an Americanized tradition. And at some um, point it's got to stop. Like, you know, like, you know, you watch everyone's going to be on Black Friday sales from the 1st of November this year probably, right? Much, yeah. It's just going to be more and more and more. And at some point you just got to say, like, this is just getting ridiculous. It's just money gouging, you know? It's funny that you say that. Um, do you know the brand I Love Ugly? Mm. He's very like that as well. He's yep. just like, said the exact same thing you just yep. said. Yeah. But yeah, it's like, I think it, yeah, I don't know how long it's got, especially in it's Australia as well. Yeah, speeding up speeding up a consumer to purchase more than mm. what they want is not a good idea. Yeah. It's just getting too fast. But at the same time, it's, it's challenging because if you don't do it, it's like, well, everyone's going to spend a shitload of money elsewhere, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a challenge... It's like that whole thing, you know, like um, the business acumen versus your morals. Where do you lie in between those things? It's it's a cl- classic and constant challenge. Mm. It starts with us, though, as like educators of um, essentially, we're the, you know, the educators of um, our own industry of clothing and manufacturing. So it's up to us to educate our consumers that maybe aren't educated on the concepts of, you know, how detrimental fast fashion really is. So it's up to us to educate them through our marketing and our comms to maybe take a backward stance on things like Black Friday. So we're hoping through um, this activation that we have in November with this other brand that's wanting um, the same message as us, um, we're hoping that that will help. That'll be sort of our first start at trying to um, put the lid on on concepts like that. Well, yeah, it's like pu- putting a message out there in the open and letting everyone know as well. For sure. And especially educating everyone as well. Yeah, that's I mean, that's that's kind of been one of our, our biggest things through through the whole life of the company. You know, like from the very start, we had to educate people on what Australian main means. And we're still doing that today. And sustainable and ethical fashion. For sure. Yeah. So that's for what sure. we have to explain all the time. It's like, this shirt's been here for 30, 40 years. Yep. You know what I mean? And yep. it's perfectly fine. Perfectly yeah. fine after a wash and a little bit of love and care. It's yeah. a great t-shirt. That's what I mean. And the same with you guys. It's like these people get p- paid fair wages. Yep. Um, it's made in Australia. Well, Australia's also, job. Yeah, yeah. And it, you know, the main thing is, is when you spend two hundred bucks on a hoodie with us, that two hundred bucks stays in this country. Every yeah. cent of it goes somewhere in this country. And especially the quality of your hoodies, they'll last forever. Absolutely. As well. Yeah, that too. That yep. too. Pe- pe- like, pe- people don't realize that if you spend two hundred bucks on our hoodie that lasts you, you know, ten years. 
you're literally spending 20 bucks a year on hoodies. Yeah. If you go to Kmart and buy a hoodie... It might last three months if you're lucky. Yeah, so that means you're buying four hoodies, which cost 16 bucks. Yeah. So four times 16 is 32 bucks. That's cheaper. But yeah. And it's better for the... Well, you know, supposedly it's better for the environment and economy and all that stuff as well, right? Yeah. That's what it is all about, I guess, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, anything else you guys want to add? Pop-ups? New drops, excited for anything in the future. There's an event activation in December as well. Keep your eyes on that. Um, More secrets. More yeah. secrets. We've got a lot of activations yeah. coming through. Yeah, we're about to get actually pretty flat out for the next little bit. Yep. Lots of collabs, lots of activations, lots of new initiatives. Um, yeah, it's going to be an exciting time. Yeah, for sure. We're bas- Yeah, we're basically at the start of really putting our foot back down on, on pushing what can be possible in Australia. So it should be sick. And my last question, where do you guys see yourself in five years? Yeah, that's an interesting one. Very interesting one. It'd be sick. It would, it would be amazing to to somehow make Australian-made, like world, world-renowned and desirable. That's a real goal of ours. You know, like to to do something truly unique and truly different would be super sick. I mean, that's kind of, what we're about is, you know, inspiring unique ways of thinking, independently unique ways of thinking. Mm. For me, probably having like a community, um, community active space where sort of our mindset and our concepts and ways of thinking um, had and housed other um, local independent creatives. So a coffee shop or, um, yeah. you know, a barber. Creative um, space with yeah. like everything. Even yourself with your vintage, yeah. vintage clothes, like a creative, a huge creative space that housed multiple different um, small businesses. Yeah, like a really, really shit hot one so that we could all kind of make, you know, the obvious problem of the rent more economical. Yeah. And it's better for everyone. Everyone grows together, you know. For sure. As well. Totally, totally. Yeah. But yeah, do you know guys want to plug Instagram um, or your socials and that sort of stuff? Itchpig, I-C-H-P-I-G, we're that everywhere. We everywhere. invented the word, so we're everywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <pretty> <laughs> Yeah, we don't need us. We don't need to pay AdWords yeah. to get itch big. Yeah, we got the website big. easily. You know? Yeah, that was a pretty that was a pretty easy one to be honest. I C H P I G on Instagram. We've just started TikTok um, website. Yep, sweet dot com. Thanks for uh, jumping on, jumping on, guys. Um, yeah, it's just been crazy. I've been following your brand for so long, and grateful for the time today. No worries, to man. Honest. Thanks for having us. Thanks Killing it. Thanks, bro. See you guys.